And I could hit record and that way we have a copy. I think it's recording now. Yes, it's recording. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, yes. So for housekeeping, so this is the Zoom event and it's being recorded. So it includes the chat, so please be respectful and appropriate. Um, please mute your microphones and turn off your video unless um, you're prompted to do otherwise. <clears throat> so today we've got a great opportunity to have 12 academics and three PhD students from across the three institutes. Um, we encourage you to use the direct or private chat function to reach out to any of these academics that are representing the research areas that you may have an interest in working in, as well as chatting with the students about what it's like to do research or honours at UQ. So you can do this at any time, um, probably except for when they're direct, directly speaking. Um, so most people have renamed themselves from, in terms of their institute, their name and their area. So please feel free to reach out. Um, in addition to that, um, please feel free to directly email any of the participants if you would like more information or to discuss a research project. Today we only have a small fraction of the researchers from the institutes, so please have a look at the web pages for the institute or institutes that you are interested in um, working in to get a broader idea of the other researchers and what specific honours projects or research areas there are, are available. Um, as institutes, we don't directly enrol students, so to um, um, introduce the um, honours program at SCMB, we have Associate Professor Michael Lance who's the Honours um, Director at SCMB. Um, he'll give you information on how to enrol in Honours and how it's structured in SCMB. And I think most of the other schools have a similar sort of structure as well. So Michael, I invite you to unmute and, um, and give your presentation. Yeah, thanks Idris. Um, so is someone advancing the slides for yeah, us? Yeah, I'm just trying to do that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, as as Idris just mentioned, I'm the, uh, one of the um, SCMB honours directors. Uh, as you'll see in a minute, there's a few different streams of honours um, at SCMB, and I'm actually the director of the molecular biosciences um, stream, which is most likely to be of of most interest to the people that are here at this this webinar today. But but there are other streams as well, which may be relevant depending on your undergraduate study and depending on your area of future research interest. So um, I've been asked just to give a bit of an introduction to what honours is and, and what you can expect from the honours program. And, and this um, series of slides that I've put together will, will focus on um, the, the SCMB honours program, the one that we're, we're responsible for administering. Um, but you may, you may find that there's an honours program in another school that's more suited um, to your undergraduate study. Um, so in terms of SCMB honours, what do we offer? So um, SCMB honours is a, a, 16, a single 16 unit course in most cases. Um, that's unless you're a biotech student, which I'll get to in a second. But um, for most honours students in SCMB, they enrol in a single 16 unit course, which is offered in two parts um, across two, sem two consecutive semesters. And so what you're looking at for honours is, is really a full-time research um, and learning commitment over a period of about 10 months when you go from the start of one semester um, to the end of the second semester and that, that little break in between as well, which most honours students work through. So what can you expect to do during honours? Well, what you can expect to do is be embedded in a lab um, that's working on a project. Usually that, that lab will be a larger team, um, which, which works as a team and, and their research will be a focused team effort. And so you really have a, a very unique and a, and, a, and a great opportunity to become a part of that team and contribute towards the collective research effort um, for the entire period of your honours of your honours year. And so in your research endeavours, you'll be mentored and guided um, by an academic who we refer to as your honours supervisor. Um, and I would, I would really stress and, and encourage you to, to speak to lots of people about honours, to speak to lots of potential supervisors and try and really find someone that's, that you think is going to be a good fit for you and that's going to inspire you um, and support you in achieving um, what we hope will be a really great outcome for the year. So honours is a, is a single 16 unit course, um, but it's assessed through uh, multiple activities which all contribute to that 16 units and these include um, a research proposal which is accompanied by a, a pass-fail seminar, um, a research report which is the major piece of assessment that you submit at the end of the year, um, as well as a, a research seminar and then we have a journal club activity that runs through the year as well which is kind of like a, a cohort building um, exercise that incorporates some elements of professional development. So if I could have the next slide please Idris. 
Um, so in order to enrol in honours, as Idris mentioned, um, the, the institutes that are represented here today aren't able to enrol honours and coursework marks to students directly. You do need to go via an enrolling unit, um, of which SCMB is one. And within SCMB, we offer honours in three different flavours. So we have uh, a chemistry flavoured honours where you enrol in a, a Chem 65 1X course. We have a molecular biosciences um, flavoured honours, which is um, uh, enrolling in a Bioc 65 1X course. Um, and then there's also the B-Biotech Honours Program, which, as I said, is not a 16-unit course. It's actually a 14-unit research project, um, which is the BIOT 612X course. And then there's also um, uh, uh, an extra coursework um, components worth two units, the Arbis US 6911 course, which you also enrol in. Um, and importantly, for the, for the people that are considering doing honours in the research institutes, if your supervisor is not an SCMB affiliated academic, then what we ask you to do at the point that you apply for honours is to nominate a school supervisor. So that school supervisor does not need to have intellectual input into the project. They don't need to be a formal collaborator. They're merely a point of contact to ensure that we have some degree um, of, of safety net and control over, um, over the people that are acting as day-to-day as -day supervisors um, for the honour students that enrol in that program. It's effectively there just to make sure that you have a formal point of contact within the school in the event that you're located off-site or in a remote location um, and, and you're unable to have that regular contact via your supervisor. Um, can I have the next slide, please, Idris? So why should you consider doing honours? Well, I think what you'll find out today is that this is really a, a rare and unique opportunity in your undergraduate experience to find out um, what it's like to be a research scientist in a real lab. Um, in addition, we think that uh, by taking an honours year at the end of your research, at the end of your undergraduate study, you'll um, come out of it with enhanced employability. You'll have the opportunity to gain direct entry into postgraduate research programs. And most importantly, the vast majority of people find honours to be an incredibly um, rewarding experience and, and an incredibly positive experience. And that's certainly something we strive to achieve. So, um, just before I finish up, one final plug, you're going to hear research projects from people in the institutes today. But um, if you don't find what you're looking for here, I'd certainly encourage you to, to come to the SCMB honours webinar, which is happening straight after this one. Um, and so we'll be talking about the projects that are available, but you can also um, find our research projects handbook on, on, on the website. And this is a, a picture of the cover of it there. So I'll now leave it to the guys from the institutes to introduce their projects. Thank you very much, Michael. Okay, so I think next on the list is we've got a short video um, that describes um, what um, I guess honours is like and research is like at the AIBN. There's no sound. Okay. Uh, leaders in their fields. Their talents, together with our leading infrastructure and equipment, allow us to create science with real world yes, in the areas of health, energy and sustainability. We're working at the cutting edge of science in areas such as bioinformatics, nanoscience, material science, synthetic biology, energy solutions and stem cell science. The real strength of the AIBM is in our cross-disciplinary nature, which enables us to do innovative research that creates change in the world. The translational focus at AIBM has allowed for some amazing scientific achievements with real impact. From the development of vaccines for major diseases, such as Hendra, the nanopatch and needle-free vaccine delivery system, research that is building new economies in regional Australia, and developing solar panels that hold the world record for the highest efficiency. But by far, our biggest achievement has been the huge number of young scientists we've mentored and worked with and helped grow into capable researchers. At the ARBN, we are committed to supporting the growth of our students and have a focus on bringing more diversity to science. So it doesn't matter who you are or what your background is, doing an owner's ear with us equips you with valuable skills, including problem solving, critical thinking, communication, and time management. I chose to do my research at the AIBM because they have great facilities. The most exciting bit of my honours project is being able to come in every day and do world-leading research, being able to come in and do everything autonomously and self-direct my research. 
The most exciting part of my honors project was working with the people in the lab, learning from people who know more than you and also have a good time while doing science. If you have a passion for research and an inquiring mind, you'll enjoy both the freedom and challenge of working in a research environment surrounded by world-leading scientists with access to the best facilities. An honors degree helps you to make the connection between learning done in undergrad and how to apply that in the real world. It opens up a range of opportunities for your research and gives you a taste of a research career. It will also qualify you to pursue higher degree by research programs like a PhD, where you can delve in more detail into your area of interest and further develop your research skills. I encourage you to take a look at the projects listed on our website, or contact our researchers and talk about how we can work to develop an honours project which fits you. Come and experience the energy in this place. Come and work with us on things which will have a real impact on the world. And just together, let's do some amazing science. And honestly. Okay, so we've got Tom the Ab again. Um, we have um, three researchers. Um, and the first one is Associate Professor Jess Ma, um, who's um, representing bioinformatics. Jess, do you want to log on? Yeah, so can everyone hear me? Yeah. Are you stuck in here? Yep. Yep, okay, yes. great. Yep. Fantastic. Um, can I have my first slide, please? Thank you. So thanks, Idris. Thanks, everyone, for making time to, to come and listen to honours. I have to say, I did honours at UQ at uh, IMB, actually, even though I'm, I'm at AIBN now. And it was honestly the most fun year of my life. So I'm really glad to see that you're all taking the first step to find out more about your honours year. So at, at AIBN, uh, the area of research that I represent is in bioinformatics. And if you're not aware about this area, Really, it's about data science, it's about programming, and ultimately our goal is to make sense of biology. So as you might guess, we are completely dry lab. Um, it doesn't mean that we don't work with people in the wet lab. We also work with clinicians, um, technologists, all sorts of people. And so if that sounds like fun to you, then I think this is a really great space to explore. I've just got a slide here that sort of breaks it down into the most basic kind of idea of what we do. And, and that's really, if you think about studying disease or studying different patients, we're in a world now where we can capture whole different kinds of biomarkers or, or data. And I think that's one of the fascinating things about being here at AIBN. As you saw in the video, uh, you heard from some of our researchers, um, including myself, but uh, about some of the technologies that help us capture this data. And really what's so fun is that we can work with them to make sense of what this data is telling us, whether it's about a disease or a phenomenon like stem cells or to identify new therapeutics. And so often on, on the left, I don't have a cursor, I apologize, but on the left-hand side, what we often see is this kind of distribution. And the reason why we need bioinformatics is it's not always so clear cut when something is extreme in terms of clinical or biological significance. And in biology, we're often in a space where we're interested in comparing different populations, right? Whether it's a disease versus a control situation or treatment A versus treatment B. And so there, the, the onus on us is even higher because what we need to do is we need to take these two different data sets and really understand in a very big data realm what is going on. And you can imagine that there are lots of different kinds of things now with all the technology that we have that qualifies as a relevant biomarker. So we can look at DNA, we can look at mRNA, we can look at all sorts of different kinds of things. And that's a lot of fun because the complexity of the problem is really huge. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Thanks. So the specific area that my group does, um, and I'm mindful of time, so I'm not gonna get into this in great detail, but just to give you the highlights, we're really interested in aging. And so we're using a lot of different kinds of single cell data to understand different dimensions of human aging. And some of that relates to drugs like anti-aging drugs like metformin. Some of it is looking at the genetics of aging, um, especially in stem cells. And also we're, we're developing new kind of machine learning approaches to take images where we can ultimately try to estimate what someone's biological age is because we know that's not the same thing as chronological age. 
Um, and obviously aging taps into all sorts of other diseases, uh, including cancer, osteoporosis, Alzheimer's disease, and many, many more. So if that sounds interesting to you, um, please drop me a line. I'd love to talk to you further and you can come meet my group. So I'll leave it there to, to just give some time for my colleagues as well, but thank you. Thanks so much, Jess. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Esteban Marcelin, um, and he's representing Advanced Biomanufacturing at ARBN. Esteban, do you wanna unmute? Sure. Um, yeah, if you can, please go to your, my first slide, Idris, thank you. So, yes, so as you all know, we're currently living in a fossil fuel economy where we use oil to make our fuels, chemicals, and plastics. And really what advanced biomanufacturing is trying to do is shift into a bioeconomy. If you can do a click, please, Idris. So the idea is by, um, and one more click, please, <clears throat> is by doing genetic modifications into cell lines. Uh, what was normally a fuel converted into a biofuel, we can use cells, and this can be bacterial cells or mammalian cells or insect cells or fungi like yeast to make uh, platform chemicals. So we're all very familiar with beers, for example, but we can also use this to make other chemicals by introducing natural and synthetic pathways. So this way we can make plastics that are degradable. And also we have an increasing problem with antibiotic resistance. And the way we manufacture our drugs is most of the time using biological systems. So if you can click for the next slide, please. So really what we're trying to do is supporting the fourth industrial revolution to provide food, energy and fuel, chemicals, and of course, health uh, solutions to the world. So the tools and the technology that enables this change is systems and synthetic biology. And we can talk about uh, this in detail after. And uh, some of the things that we do is basically building cell factories. So we are very familiar with how a factory looks nowadays, but the idea of using a factory uh, as tiny as a cell enables us to make things biologically. And then we put these cells in fermenters and we start making these products. If you can go to the next uh, slide, Idris, please. So at AIBN, in the area of advanced biomanufacturing, we have many facilities. Uh, we have a lot of increased facilities spanning from nanofabrication to making biologics. So many of you have probably heard of uh, the COVID, the UQ COVID vaccine, which is being manufactured in collaboration between SCMB and AIBN. Uh, and uh, some of it was done within the National Biologics Facility. We also have the metabolomics and proteomics facilities and protein expression. And we house two centers, one being the new ARC Center of Excellence in Synthetic Biology, which we can talk a bit more if anybody is interested. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Idris. So just to give you an example of the uh, things we can do using advanced biomanufacturing. So we've all heard that CO2 is affecting our planet. So if you go to the next slide, we can uh, take cells that naturally consume this CO2. And if you do a click, please, two clicks actually, that would be faster. Um, we can uh, metabolically engineer these cells. To, they natively consume CO2, but we can actually refractor those cell lines to make uh, plastics, jet fuels, and platform chemicals. And that way, one more click, we can hopefully uh, start recycling carbon and avoiding our planet getting hotter and hotter. So how do we do this? And if you go to the next slide, it's really by putting CO2 in fermenters and using a design, build, test, learn cycle where we design a cell line, we build it using molecular biology, we test it using omics, and then we use machine learning to learn what are the changes that uh, had a positive impact. In. And my last slide, um, please. So these really are the various groups. Um, so of course, Professor Paul Young is the head of school 
at SEMB, but also has a group, is a, also a group leader here. Keith um, is working in the COVID vaccine. Linda is the uh, director of protein expression facility. Uh, Shunxia is working on the interface between nanomaterials and bioengineering. Uh, myself, you just heard, and Lars is working on systems and synthetic biology. And if you have other questions, please just visit our website. And that's it from me. Thank you. Thanks, Esteban. Our next speaker Hi. is Professor Chris Sturridge, um, and he's going to talk to us about nanomedicine. Chris, you want to unmute? Thanks, Idris. Uh, so I'm Chris. You can take it back to that other slide. Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. Uh, I'm a senior group leader in AIBN and I also did my honours degree in SCMB in chemistry. I won't tell you when that was. <laughs> uh, it was a fantastic experience for me and, and really was an exciting time in my career. So today I want to tell you a little bit about nanomedicine, which is one of the focus areas of AIBN. Uh, so I show you this slide here as an example of how science and nanomedicine is so interdisciplinary. So in collaboration with visualization experts and also social scientists um, at UNSW, we've, we've developed a virtual reality experience that allows us to convert terabytes or even petabytes of real imaging data that we collect in our group and turn it into a single virtual experience. So what you see here uh, is someone who's able to walk around with a, in a VR uh, experience looking at, at real data. Uh, so, you, so you can address new methods as well as uh, address scientific questions. So next question, uh, next slide please, Idris. But I guess what you're asking is what is nanomedicine? Uh, so nanomedicine's basically taking all the various aspects of nanotechnology uh, and applying them to health and medical applications. It is interdisciplinary uh, and it spans both the physical and the life sciences. So you can see in this futuristic looking scheme here, uh, that we might have nanoparticles, which are those, those things floating around. They've got antibodies attached to the surface that may have been developed um, through bioengineering approaches. And then they're attaching onto, onto disease cells uh, through antigenic interactions. So you've got biological interactions as well. So it truly is a, an interdisciplinary field. Uh, for example, within my group, we've got students and postdocs who are chemists, biologists, biochemists, physicists, imaging scientists, engineers, including bioengineering that you just heard from um, Esteban. And we've even got clinical specialists who work here. And, and these people have de decided to add a translational research element to their career. Uh, next slide, Idris. I just wanted to give you a very quick um, summary of some work or preview of some work that we, and aspects of nanomedicine. Uh, so they can be used in di diagnostics and detection that you can see on the left-hand side. So this is in, in conjunction with high-end imaging. Uh, we can use them to understand disease. So in the middle, you can see live cell imaging uh, that's showing nanomedicines interacting with the nucleus of cells. And we can also use them as enhanced therapeutics. Uh, and on the right-hand side, uh, you've got nanomedicines being used to treat prostate cancer in dogs. Uh, so this is a veterinary trial. So basically, it's an evolving field, and I really do welcome students from all scientific backgrounds uh, to look at the various projects in nanomedicine on the ARBN website and drop me a line if you, if you want to have a chat today. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. That's great. Okay, so next we have Rob Capon, and he's going to give us a brief introduction about um, IMB. Hello. So, um, thanks very much for the opportunity to present uh, on IMB. So, the Institute of Molecular Bioscience has been uh, operating at the university for about 20 years, and we're a very large organisation, much like the other institutes that you've heard of, AIBN. Um, and we have uh, over 35 uh, research leaders, some are group leaders, others are very senior uh, early career researchers, postdocs, um, operating across uh, three divisions uh, and a multitude of centres. So I thought what I'd do today is, uh, if I can, is uh, walk you through our website to give you an idea how you might go about finding the right match for a project uh, for you. So assuming that this all works, uh, can I you share, share your screen now? Can I share my screen? Let's see. All right. So I'm assuming everybody can see this very yep. dramatic picture of a spider. Um, one of our research groups, uh, uh, Glenn King, works on spiders, not all of us. So for those of you who are arachnophobes, you don't have to encounter spiders if you come to IMB. Uh, visiting our website, if you go to the um, heading research, you'll see there's one there for research leaders. And if you click on that, uh, you will see 
a, a large number of our research leaders, each one of them has a web page which can explain something of their areas of interest. Uh, if you go back, you can drill down to their research groups. So when you go to their research groups, you see some of the projects are there, some of the uh, participants in their group, their postdoctoral uh, fellows, their professional officers, and of course, their uh, PhD students. So if you know some people, this is a way to find them and perhaps have a conversation uh, other than through the group leader. Uh, we also have, uh, so I'll just click on the research groups so you get to sort of see it's a higher level, not quite the helicopter view, but standing on the top of a ladder, looking down and you can see the, the different research groups across the three divisions, genetics and genomics, cell and de developmental biology uh, and chemistry and structural biology. If you uh, drill down uh, further, you can have a look at the centres. So those research groups uh, have um, amalgamated into areas of uh, research uh, similarity and, and strength. So there's a Centre for Inflammation and Disease Research, and you will hear something about that today. A Centre for Pain Research, Solar and Biotechnology, and you can see the other centres there. If you go into those centres, you can see which researchers are associated with the centres, and that might help you make a choice about your projects. But you know, at a very fundamental level, if you go to students down to honours, we have a description of the honours program at IMB. As has already been mentioned, the institutes don't run an honours program, but we do uh, participate in the programs of a number of different schools. Uh, and in terms of projects, there's a button here and you can drill down a little bit further and you can have a look at the different available projects in the honours space for the research groups within each of our divisions. So that's just a, uh, a, um, uh, a quick um, account of the um, uh, diversity of research activities that you will find uh, at the Institute of Molecular Life Science. And I think at this stage I can hand over to uh, a number of our group leaders who will uh, give you a more specific account of their areas. Thanks for that, Rob. Uh, I'll just share my screen again. Okay. Um, so our first um, speaker from IMB is um, Dr. Nathan Palplant. Do you want to unmute Nathan? Yep, sounds great. Um, all right. Well, it's, uh, it's great for uh, uh, us to have a chance to present some of the work uh, that we do at the IMB. And uh, so I want to just give a brief overview of uh, the uh, labs that are working in the area of cardiac and vascular research. So uh, if we can go to the next slide, uh, what you can see here, go ahead and click again. Um, what you can see here is some of the group leaders at the IMB who are working in the areas of cardiac and vascular biology. Um, and, and we have quite a number of individuals that are working across a diverse spectrum of uh, techniques. From, uh, and, and as uh, Rob mentioned, this includes uh, experts in chemistry and cell biology, uh, organ physiology and animal physiology, as well as statistical genetics. Um, and uh, we also have a number of key partners uh, in the clinical space uh, at, at a number of the hospitals around uh, Brisbane uh, that are engaged with the research that we're doing at the IMB. Uh, and the next slide. Uh, go, go ahead and click again. Great. So this is just a, a basic rundown on some of the key areas of emphasis and expertise that we have across the groups. And it's really looking at the uh, spectrum of uh, how we integrate ideas uh, at the onset of sort of discovery science uh, all the way through to understanding how this impacts uh, patient care and trying to stitch these uh, areas together. And so the, the uh, research groups at the IMB include uh, experts that have, uh, as uh, uh, Rob mentioned, the experts in uh, chemistry. And so we're working on developing uh, new pharmacological drugs that are improving the recovery of hearts and brains from uh, injuries like strokes and heart attacks. Uh, we also have a number of individuals that are looking at uh, population statistical genetics. So how do variants in the genome uh, uh, increase the uh, probability that people will have heart or vascular diseases. Uh, and so we're working with very large genomic data sets to try to understand some of the complexities there. Uh, in addition to working with uh, different model systems like stem cell biology, 
uh, and animal biology, uh, genetic engineering, uh, uh, including large uh, uh, efforts around uh, trying to build in uh, the, the work around uh, single cell sequencing to try to understand how decisions are made in individual cells as they uh, uh, make decisions in the context of development or disease. So this is a, a fairly broad scope of uh, capabilities that I think provide a number of uh, interesting areas for uh, students to engage in, uh, whether you have expertise or interests in computational biology or chemistry or uh, cell biology or animal biology. Uh, we have a lot of exciting directions that we can take uh, in building you into an integrated system at the IMB uh, to, to build up your uh, areas of interest. So I think that covers the major areas and I would be happy to take any questions if people have any uh, after the meeting. Thank you very much, Nathan, that was great. So our next um, speaker from um, IMB is Professor Kate Schroeder. Do you want to unmute Kate? Uh, yes, I think I'm unmuted, are we yes. good? Yeah, yep, all fantastic. Done clear. <laughs> Uh, so I'm here today uh, representing the Centre for Inflammation and Disease Research. I'm the director there. And um, if we could just go forward a slide. Uh, and I should say that also that, um, oh, that's not me. That's uh, the next one. I'm hoping somebody's got my slides there. Should I share my slides? This one here? Ah, there we go. That's it. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, very smooth. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I should also say that I did honours at UQ and it was a terrific experience. It's very... Um, I had a sort of fledgling interest in research that was really cemented during that year, so I really encourage everyone to do it. Uh, so the Centre of Inflammation and Disease Research is, of course, interested in inflammation. Um, and inflammation is a really key process in the body that is uh, required for it to mount an immune response to an infection, like, for example, COVID-19, very topical. Um, but inflammation can go wrong. It can go haywire, and that can cause all sorts of diseases in humans from things that we consider your classic inflammatory diseases like arthritis or chronic inflammatory bowel disease, uh, all the way through to um, things that we are now starting to understand uh, are inflammatory diseases, including things like neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, motor neuron disease. Uh, so if we can go forward. Uh, so this is a really fundamental, important process that we need to understand in order to, um, uh, uh, for the betterment of human health. Uh, and we do the full gamut from discovery science through to translational research. Uh, on the translational end, we, um, uh, we do all sorts of things like human disease profiling, animal models, cell-based assays, uh, in order to gain a greater understanding of disease processes so that we can design new inhibitors uh, for these pathways uh, that we can then use as new anti-inflammatory or anti-infective drugs. Um, and we have um, uh, currently a, a great success coming out of the center. We have a, a molecule in phase two clinical trials uh, that targets the inflammasome, the, um, my, my own love. Uh, and uh, that's now in phase two clinical trials for hereditary inflammatory disease and also for uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, so this is a tried and tested pipeline. If we could go forward another one. Um, we do a lot of different work within the center from really basic disease uh, all the way through to the very translational aspects I just talked about. Uh, you can think of inflammation as a process that's initiated when uh, cell or organism homeostasis uh, becomes disturbed. Uh, and this can be things like uh, infection, um, uh, environmental uh, or, uh, factors or lifestyle that precipitate things like diabetes. Um, even aging, sadly, as I get older, um, this worries me more and more. Um, cell damage, genetic mutations, all of these sorts of things. Um, we can consider a sort of uh, dysregulation of homeostasis. This then triggers inflammatory mechanisms. So cells, uh, pathways and mediators are turned on. Um, and there's a lot of work uh, in both um, uh, understanding how homeostasis becomes dysregulated, how that then turns on inflammatory cells how it drives inflammatory mechanisms, and then how all of that pushes uh, towards the diseases we can see here on the right. Uh, things like chronic liver disease, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, cancer, arthritis, uh, pretty much you name it, it has a, an inflammatory component. And just underneath here, I've listed all the groups working on these different areas. Um, so please do look up those research groups and um, uh, get in contact with them if you're interested in working on any of these areas. Um, so please, um, I'll hand over next to our next IMB um, uh, Centre Director, 
But um, I, I look forward to getting lots of questions from you all and uh, seeing you all around the IMB in the years to come. Thanks, Kate. That was a great interview. So just our next speaker is um, Dr. Mark um, Baskovich. Do you want to unmute Mark? Hi, I'm here. Um, thanks very much. So I'm director of the Center for Superlink Solutions. Um, this is a, a group of researchers that's focused on finding solutions to the threat posed by antimicrobial resistance, which um, the World Health Organization has indicated is one of the, the greatest threats to human health that we're going to face um, over the next couple of decades. So one of the key goals of the center um, is focused on training up the next generation of scientists to help fight this issue. And that's, you know, honors program is a key role in that. Um, if I get the next slide, please. So the center is really focused um, around programs in chemistry and medicinal chemistry, looking at trying to discover new antibiotics and develop them. And so anchoring the antibiotic discovery are a couple of different approaches. So one's a, a chemical synthetic approach led by the community for open antimicrobial drug discovery, where we're, we're trying to discover untested synthetic chemical diversity from around the world. And the other approach is from a natural products discovery approach led by, by Rob Capon, um, driven by a Soils for Science initiative where you're trying to discover microbes that grow in soil samples and produce unusual um, compounds which have potential to become the next antibiotic. Within the antibiotic development program, we've got focused medicinal chemistry that are, are structured on trying to advance antibiotics and characterize them. And we've got funding from a number of global antibiotic development agencies to help that process. But the other area of interest of research that researchers within um, the Center for Superbug Solutions have is in developing diagnostics because one of the, the best ways to reduce the unnecessary use of antibiotics is to improve the detection of infections and be able to prescribe the appropriate antibiotic at the first time. So there are several different projects we have looking at developing diagnostics, um, incorporating whole genome sequencing, incorporating developing fluorescent imaging, um, trying to use PET imaging to detect infections as well. And these are all anchored by extensive collaborations with researchers around the world, both academic and a lot of industry as well. So we're very focused on developing translational solutions. And that also incorporates a lot of uh, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary research, which really is a strength of, of IMB. You've got a whole host of researchers from all different disciplines based at IMB that you can readily establish collaborations. And for example, for infections, given the, the interaction with inflammation, there's some natural bridges there between some of the other research groups and centers. So I'll, I'll leave it there, but there are plenty of opportunities and I'm happy to discuss research projects with anyone interested. Thank you very much for that, Mark. Um, our next speaker is the Associate Professor Irina Zeta. Should I mute Irina? Yep, here I am. So thanks very much for the opportunity to present some of the work that the Centre for Pain Research is doing. And I'm, I'm director of, um, of that division of the IMB. So if you just want to go to the next slide. Uh, so being at a um, molecular bioscience institute, um, as the name suggests, the Centre for Pain Research is interested in pain, but really um, we're very much focused on the basic and translational pain research aspects. Uh, so some of the projects that we're um, conducting and involved in uh, include understanding peripheral pain pathways to discovering new analgesic targets to discovering new analgesic drugs and then taking this right through to um, clinical development through preclinical models and also clinical research. Um, so there's about 10 group leaders associated uh, with the Centre for Pain Research. And as Rob pointed out before, you will find some of this information on specific projects and their specific research interests on the IMB uh, website. So today I just thought I'd give you a really broad overview of this, the types of projects that we're involved in. Uh, so uh, we are interested in understanding pain mechanisms and neuronal function and neuronal excitability and the sorts of uh, techniques that you might be using and learning to uh, and do these projects would be, for example, um, electrophysiology um, and neuronal imaging. We're also involved in analgesic drug discovery. And so we're using um, structural biology and molecular modeling to understand how um, drugs interact with um, analgesics. We're also using transcriptomic approaches to understand, uh, for example, at the gene regulation level, what um, uh, targets are changed in painful diseases. We're using um, cellular models of pain. So for example, um, primary sensory neurons, 
and also stem cell derived neurons to understand the pharmacology of how these neurons um, signal. Um, also um, looking at interactions with other cell types and for example, working together with the Center for Inflammation um, Disease and Research on, on the sensory neuron uh, inflammatory cell interaction. Um, as Rob mentioned, we've also got quite an active uh, interest in using venoms as uh, a source of novel analgesic drugs. And so we've actually got a number of groups involved in this. Um, Glenn King was one, one person mentioned who's interested in spiders, but actually there's quite a number of us who work on venoms derived from scorpions, cone snails, um, snakes, jellyfish, uh, even plants. And we use these venoms to uh, find new analgesic drug leads and also to understand how venoms can actually uh, cause pain. Uh, we also have uh, preclinical models of pain where we can take some of these compounds that we discover for, forward to uh, preclinical testing. And, and lastly, we're also involved in um, with our ge the genetics and genomics division in um, de developing personalized medicine, so under understanding um, some of the genetic mutations that underlie painful conditions and also understanding how our, our genes affect pain in general. So um, that's pretty much it for me at the moment. So very broad overview, um, but I, if you're interested in any of these techniques or areas in particular, feel free to shoot me a line and I can put you in contact with uh, specific research groups. Thank you very much, Irina. So the last speaker for IMB is Professor Ben Hanchema. Hi. Yep, thank you for giving me the opportunity. Um, I wanted to just present the work for the Centre for Solar Biotechnology. We have 30 international teams in the centre and we're focused on building next generation uh, technologies driven by the sun, solar driven industries. Could you go to the next slide, please? And these are being used for a, a whole range of products, whether they are from, uh, sorry, could you just put the next animation on? Oh, okay. Um, th there, sh there should be a slide there. <laughs> with um, showing you as one of these solar driven industries uh, where you have algal technologies, which are in 3D to generate a whole range of different products. And we are looking for people to do their honors projects with us in the areas of structural biology, mathematics and software development and economics, where we, we model whole systems. Uh, we're looking for molecular biologists, for the production of a whole range of therapeutic proteins, whether it is lysins for antibiotics or aquaculture therapeutics, monoclonal antibodies, etc., And we also uh, are looking for biotechnology students who are involved in the development of production cell lines, whether they improve light capture or the um, splitting open of the cells to release the content for making high value uh, nanocellulose products and a whole range of other products that might be of interest. So if you wanna be part of that solution to develop next generation industries that are driven by the sun, please feel free to get in touch with me and my email address is at the top. Thank you very much, Ben, that's great. Um, so we'll move on now to Coffee. So Mary, do you wanna give, give us an overview of Coffee briefly? Okay, thanks Idris. Yeah, well Coffee, or the Queensland Alliance of Agricultural and Food Innovation, which is quite a mouthful, is divided into four centers. So we've got an agricultural and a food focus, obviously. Um, but one of the things about it is the applied nature of our research. We have very much focused on industry and industry outcomes in the agricultural sectors and the food sectors. But for those of you who don't actually have an agricultural food background, we welcome any scientists because most of our research is so very inter interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary. My own background is chemistry. I'm sitting in the center of animal science. I don't particularly have an animal science background, but I use my chemistry for animal science outcomes. So we do welcome all students in these areas. So from chemistry, biochemistry, molecular, bioinformatics, genetics, molecular, uh, microbiology, biotechnology, anyone who has an interest in doing applied type research um, for increasing food production, all those um, feel good um, outcomes, we can find a space for you that you will fit in. You just have to, there's a booklet of honours projects. We've got more than 70 honours pro projects on this year. We are really keen to get honours students. Coffee itself is not as old, an old an institute as IMB and AIBN, perhaps not as well known, but we have real impact um, research where we actually do impact in the industries 
just as much as produce scientific outcomes. Um, so I'm going to hand over to my um, um, centre representative. So we've got the Centre of Crop Science, the Centre for Nutrition and Food Science, the Centre for Horticulture Science, and the Centre for Animal Science. Before I do hand over, though, I do have to say that we also have diverse locations as well as diverse science. So while AOB and IMB is uh, located primarily at St. Lucia, Coffee has spaces around the state. We have quite a large presence at St. Lucia, but we equally have a large presence at the Eco Sciences um, Institute over at Dutton Park and the um, Health and Food Science um, Precinct at Cooper's Plains. The reason we have these um, places is because we have a direct link with industry. So we're, we've come out, we're straightly linked with the Department of Agriculture and Food Innovation. So if you really want to have a practical focus on your um, research, as well as obviously pure science, we would welcome you to join Coffee. We have other diverse locations. No one is forced to go to any to move out of Brisbane, but if you want to do a research project in regional Queensland, we can find somewhere for you from Warwick to Nambour, and even further afield. So I'll just hand over to my research um, representatives. Thank you very much, Mary. So the next speaker is Professor Ian Goblin. Ian, do you want to unmute? Yep. Yeah, thanks. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm the director for the Centre of Crop Science. So to give you a bit of an idea of that centre, we work on everything from nucleotide level stuff right up to satellite imaging, um, all the way through gene cells, plants, paddocks and farming systems. Um, the whole um, of the, the centre, we're at four places. So we've got presence at St Lucia, at the Gatton campus, we're also in Toowoomba and in Warwick. And um, the, the picture of me holding up a beer there is to remind me to tell you that that is actually the, um, the first use of biotechnology and, and to my mind still one of the best. Um, but also to remind me to tell you that uh, a lot of what we do in the Centre for Crop Sciences, we work predominantly on the major crops like the cereals and the legumes and the cereals um, provide about 65% of human nutrition worldwide. Um, could I get the next slide, please? So we've got uh, three main themes within our uh, center, which is crop improvement, crop physiology and modeling and farming systems and agronomy. And as, as um, the, the pictures show, we've got all the way from uh, working at the subcellular level, doing uh, a lot of gene editing work to improve these crops. Um, a lot of um, work on physiology, which could be in glass houses, uh, in the field. We're, we're always running field experimentation. Um, and a lot of the focus that we've got with the, the crops that we're working on is in um, end use quality but also in the sustainability, um, giving us things like a heat tolerance, drought tolerance, um, finding ways to turn over generations more quickly, et cetera. And um, so the, the bit of the word cloud in there shows you a range of the sorts of things that we work on, including some of the, the crops. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if I said this, but we've got over a hundred scientists within this center and it's pretty easy to find you a project where you can be lab-based, where you can be field-based, or whether you can sit on a computer and analyze um, remote sensing data. And to give you a bit of an idea of how good the remote sensing and um, machine learning data is now that it's being generated, um, we can make crops um, with gene editing to have higher protein contents, for example, and from a, about a one meter squared area, remote sensing using satellites can actually pick up protein diversity across a field trial. Um, so that's the sort of the scale of the work that is involved in the Center for Crop Science. So thanks. Um, thanks, Ian. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Louise um, Parkinson. Hi, uh, Hi yes, that's me. Um, I'm, I'm for CHS though, so I'm, I think I'm the next few slides, unless you're happy for me to share my screen. 
Yeah, there we go. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Louisa. I did my honours with SCMB and I did the Bachelor of Biotech program um, in plant biotechnology. And I did my PhD uh, with Coffee as well as my honours project was a Coffee project and now I work for Coffee. Um, Coffee, I just want to let everybody know we are actually the number one agricultural institute in Australia and we're in the top five in the entire world. The kind of research that we do is fantastic and high impact. And I just love working for this institute. So let's go to the next slide. So in the Centre for Horticultural Science, we have three research themes, plant pathology, biotechnology and breeding. So plant pathology is a huge uh, field and there's many of us based at ESP or Eco Sciences Precinct. I work at the Eco Sciences Precinct and the things that we focus on is in identifying disease and discovering new species as well as diagnosing disease. So one field is taxonomy, which is what I, I work in and I I sit there and I analyze genes of, of new species of fungi and I discover new species and I write about it. Um, sometimes we go out into the field and we find completely new diseases that are new records for Australia and the sorts of things you can do is that as well. And those papers get published and it's a first record and it's, it's super exciting. So um, on, on the right here is, um, is a phylogenetic tree that I made um, and published as a student and you can see a cool little uh, scientific diagram I made of a, a fungal structure called a conidiophore. Um, you learn taxonomy language, which is a whole language in, Excel, in, in itself, and you'll have lots of experience in a PC2 lab. So if you look at the bottom of the screen, there's the fields of science which you can get um, skills in. Um, another thing, uh, next slide please. Uh, what I also work in and my honours student works in is in diagnostics. So with COVID, for example, researchers had to rapidly scramble to develop tests to be able to rapidly uh, diagnose disease in patients. We actually do the same thing, but for plants. Um, and it's super important for biosecurity. We don't, we want to make sure and protect um, our country from exotic pests and diseases that we don't have because it can have dire effects on the entire industry. Um, and there's a lot of molecular skills you can gain from that as well. Um, bioinformatics is a big component of that uh, when you design diagnostic tests. Uh, so that there's some skills you can get from that too. And the final slide for plant pathology, um, yep, is integrated disease management. So who here loves travel? Um, because this is the kind of work that you'll be doing. You'll go out into orchards, you'll diagnose disease, you'll learn firsthand experience, um, what it's like to interact with growers um, and, and see what disease looks like in the field. So our researchers, uh, Elizabeth Dan, who I did my PhD with, um, I don't have an agriculture background, but uh, when I started my PhD with her, I now know all about the avocado industry and how, how tree crops are grown. So you'll learn that kind of stuff too. Um, you'll also get some biochemistry knowledge and all sorts of other skills um, with this sort of work too. So if you, if you love being out in the field, IDM is the kind of work you want to do. Okay, next slide. Uh, I did my um, honours in biotech and we also have biotech at the Centre for Horticultural Science and that's based at St Lucia. And they do all sorts of really cool things. Uh, tissue culture is one of my favorite things they do over there. So can you imagine being in Bunnings, right? It's a huge, uh, huge building. And think about nurseries. Nurseries have to grow plants in large facilities like that. But if you can grow an entire nursery in a small lab um, through tissue culture, that's saving so much space and time and, and resources. And that's the kind of stuff that they do with tissue culturing avocados, for example, at, at Nina Mitter's lab. So you can check them out. Uh, final, final slide uh, for CHS. Uh, so if you love computational biology and working with computers and coding and programming, this is the kind of stuff you want to do. Um, and that's all about breeding and um, designing and statistical modeling um, and predicting how plants are going to grow in the best way they can. Um, so uh, our researchers, uh, Craig Hardner, especially, uh, he does. He has a lot of stuff to do with predictive modeling, and um, if you, if that's the kind of thing you want to do, uh, get involved with that. And I, I highly recommend having a bioinformatics or computational biology skill set um, by the time you graduate, because we do quite a bit of it, um, no matter what science field you're in. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Our so next speaker is um, Dr. Sandra Olata Mantilla. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, it is um, yeah, really there. Uh, one, before, one more before, please. That's it. Uh, so, hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm Sandra Olarte Mantilla. I'm a sensory and consumer scientist within uh, Synapse. Uh, and this particular picture is from the opening of our ARC training center for uniquely Australian foods. Uh, that was pre COVID time. 
And what you can see there is the diversity of our uh, team of students, um, uh, postdocs, and well, in fun times. Um, yep, yeah, next one, please. So in our uh, center, um, we have a strong team of uh, chief investigators leading postdocs and students. Uh, there are nine uh, investigators with a strong expertise areas led by Prof. Mike Eadley, um, who is studying plant-based foods and nutrition. Also, we have Jasmina Sultanbawa studying preservation technologies, food safety, and native foods, and also working with Australian indigenous communities. Heather Smile working on flavor chemistry, sensory and consumer science. Yes, you do get to taste a lot of um, exciting food products. And Daniel Cosolino uh, working on non-destructive and rapid analytical methods like uh, meat infrared spectroscopy. Michael Nexel working on nutrition on phytochemicals like uh, folate in uh, strawberries. Eugenie Rora working on nutritional chemosensing in um, eggs. Uh, Timo Hare working on biofortification in a uh, purple sweet corn as an example. Lou Hoffman working on everything in science. Bob Gilbert working on the starch glycogen, um, understanding the structure, function, and biosynthesis of starch like potato, barley. Uh, next one, please. Uh, thank you. Um, so we have 25, 24 uh, honors to uh, projects available. And some of them are um, in honey uh, from European bees, um, native uh, stingless bee honey edible insects, which I am particularly working on, um, understanding while well, these projects are all um, in multidisciplinary and requires different skills that even if you don't have them, you are able to learn them. Um, so we, are, we go from uh, the chemistry, sensory, microbiology, in the honey, but also on Australian native ingredients. We do product development in, pro in these projects, microbiology, um, sensory, Another project is um, working on, um, on working on um, premium products like vacuum beef, beef, um, understanding the mouth feel of of the of the fat on vacuum beef from the sensory point of view, and understand using techniques like uh, rheology and trebiology to understand the physical the texture of the of the of the fat. In biofortification, we have an example which is with purple sweet corn. Um, that, and we will be have the chance to use chemistry skills, sensory science, molecular biology. We also have projects understanding why we have a difference, different perceptions on the texture on food from the point of view of sensory science and involving other disciplines uh, like chemical engineering and biochemistry. And we also are studying the impact of climate change, the impact that uh, the stress that creates on like dating source. And we use uh, skills uh, from molecular biology, microbiology, and computational science uh, that is led by uh, Eugenie Rohr. So if you have any questions, just go to our website and just get in contact with us. Uh, in the questions, just please free to uh, send me a text. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. So the last speaker for coffee is Dr. Ali Ambraza. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I am uh, Ali from Center for Animal Science. I'm working as a uh, postdoc with a fellow uh, in the center. So I'll go through um, the different research groups uh, which you can apply for your this project. Next slide, please. So um, the Center for Animal Science is a, a leading tropical livestock research and development institute. Um, and we are providing um, world-class research to the Australian animal industry. Uh, we have three different research themes, which are animal health, um, which covers the diseases and the uh, causative agents, animal welfare and uh, different product and systems. So I'll quickly uh, go through the um, profiles of different uh, uh, researchers so you can uh, have an idea what sort of research we are doing. Next slide, please. Uh, Professor Ben Heiss is a geneticist and uh, he is uh, working on cattle genetics uh, to improve the health and productivity of uh, cattle. Um, his group has uh, uh, a very, very cool different projects 
ranging from uh, genomics, uh, use of RNA-seq technologies, all the high throughput um, sequencing technologies and data science to improve the um, uh, production in, in Australian cattle, uh, as well as they're trying to use the next gen um, sequ sequencing technologies uh, to use the sequencing technologies into the field and, and the, the sequencing can be done uh, within uh, 24 hours in the field conditions. Uh, they also, uh, they're also working on um, uh, the, you, uh, the studying the DNA methylation uh, to determine the age of uh, cattle. That's a real um, applica applicable project in the field. And they're also uh, working on the methanogens. Next slide, please. Uh, Professor Ala Tabor, uh, she's um, an animal biotechnologist, and uh, uh, our group is uh, working on a range of um, high throughput omics techniques uh, uh, to study their uh, tick resistance in cattle. Uh, we are also working on developing vaccines. Uh, our vaccine is in um, clinical trial now. Uh, so we, we are doing animal trials at Kunjara Hill. So if you're interested to do some field work as well as uh, lab work, uh, we will welcome you. Uh, we are also using high, uh, the next generation sequencing um, uh, technologies uh, to, to, do, to develop the peak genome quickly. And our group is also working to develop diagnostic um, methods for, uh, for, for the cough, uh, cough loss methods and, and, and the and compiler bacterium in, in cattle. Next slide, please. Uh, Dr. Uh, Lewis is a ruminant nutrition specialist, and uh, he is working on uh, recycling of nitrogen as a determinant for feed efficiency in different cattle breeds. Uh, and uh, he's also working on nutritional modulation of the, for the transfer of uh, passive immunity in, in cattle. So he's applying a range of um, uh, high throughput technologies, including mass spec analysis. Uh, his, uh, most of the work is uh, based at CATAM. So if you are interested to uh, work away from, from, the, from the city and in work into the field, uh, probably in, in the best uh, guide to contact. Uh, next, please. Um, Associate Professor uh, Mary Fletcher, she's an organic chemist. She introduced, she introduced herself earlier. Uh, she's an organic chemist. She's working on uh, identifying uh, toxic plants in cattle and how to mitigate their toxicity uh, to avoid the cattle uh, at pastures. Uh, she's also working on determine the bioactive con contents of the Australian uh, native bee honey. Next, please. Dr. Connie Turney is a microbiologist. She is uh, based at the Ecoscience Precinct and uh, our group is um, uh, working on um, uh, respiratory bacterial pathogens of livestock, poultry, and the wild, uh, uh, wildlife um, and, and they use uh, different uh, techniques like the serology, genotyping, sequencing, and uh, they're also a, a reference laboratory uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the region uh, for doing the antimicrobial resistance testing and, and the uh, sequencing for, for these pathogens. Next, please. Uh, Professor Tim Mahoney is a virologist and uh, his group is working on characterization of the um, bovine viral pathogens. Uh, they are also working on uh, gene edit editing technologies to improve the animal resistance to various infections. And uh, uh, his group is particularly working on bovine herpes viruses. So you can find a complete list of the projects that are available uh, from uh, Center of Animal Science. Uh, if you're interested to join, we will welcome you. Thank you. Thanks, Ali. So we have some um, PhD students from each of the institutes. So James, if you're still there, do you want to unmute and give us uh, your perspective of um, being a student at IRBM? Yeah, no worries. Uh, good day, everyone. So a uh, bit of background for perspective. Uh, I did a chemical engineering degree uh, in Canterbury uh, of New Zealand. So uh, I did my honours through that and then uh, spoke with Esteban, who you heard present some projects and came over uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and so one of the big things that I noticed moving over here was the amount of resources and the opportunities that really come with that. And I think that's a, uh, quite a big thing to consider. There's far less barriers to uh, doing what you want to do, which is pretty cool. Um, and so a lot of what you've heard is... Uh, uh, massive diversity in uh, the 
projects that are available. And I think it's also, uh, therefore there is also a massive diversity in the people that are doing those projects. And so I'd really encourage you to try and ask lots of questions um, and just learn as much as you can while you're there. Uh, and yeah, gain, gain the experience uh, while you're there. Um, and one of the other things that uh, a few people have also said is there's a great balance between uh, the kind of industrial research and academic research. Uh, and that is quite important, I think, for getting an idea of what you want to do after your honours, after your PhD, uh, wherever you go afterwards. And then, so for me, my honours was my favourite bit of my undergraduate. Um, and it's a, uh, really great being able to apply what you've learned over the last couple of years um, and get a bit of a feeling for uh, how that's actually used. And then just quickly on the student committees, which is uh, why, why I'm here. So IMB, QAFI, uh, Airbnb and the SCMB all have student committees. Um, and through these, we try to encourage a good work-life balance, some networking, uh, and as well as some professional development. And I would really encourage you to try and uh, get involved in those while you're there, not necessarily as a committee member or anything, but just show up to events and uh, yeah, talk to some people. Cheers. Thanks, James. That was great. Um, Sophie, do you want to give the IMB perspective? Sure. So I'm Sophie. I'm a first year PhD student in Nathan Palpin's lab, who talked earlier, and I did my honours there as well last year. Um, and so I think honours for me was like a chance to, to to see what research was like and see if it was for me. And I mean, since I'm still here, clearly it was. Um, and I think during my honours year, I I really got the chance to try a lot of different things. Um, so I got to combine my wet lab, uh, wet lab and dry lab background, or I guess interests um, in my project. And I did this big single cell RNA sequencing experiment um, in to look at the gene regulation involved in heart development. Um, and I think my project let me learn uh, lots and lots of different fields and types of um, techniques from uh, wet lab stuff. So just like cell biology, tissue culture, flow, cytometry, um, and then also really develop my um, skills in bioinformatics um, to use other people's programs and also to adapt and make my own to analyze this data set. And um, so, yeah, I do think that being in the IMB and being around so many other like ambitious um, and just collaborative people really helped me um, be able to pull off this type of um, big project. And yeah, I do think that also being around uh, so many other research interests and research fields, you really get to see um, all the different ways you can attack different scientific questions and what questions you can ask. And um, yeah, and just really see what possibilities are out there. And so yeah, I really recommend doing an honours year. It was a really good experience. Thank you, Sophie. So our final um, student is Harrison from Coffee. Uh, yeah, good day. Thanks a lot for having me. Uh, so I'm a first year PhD student in Coffee Centre for Animal Science, and I did a Bachelor of Biotechnology and finished my honours last year. And I was working on bioinformatics applied to livestock for animal welfare. Uh, I absolutely loved my experience doing honours at Coffee, and if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be here where I am today doing my PhD, because I'd actually never considered a career in research up until uh, I started doing my honours. I think there's two things to look for when you're choosing where you want to do your honours, and that's look for supportive supervisors, but also a supportive um, student network. And that's one thing that I loved about Coffee was my supervisors were just amazingly supportive the entire way through my honours. Um, but they also, they pushed me pretty hard to maintain a high standard of work, which really helps with the final outcome of your honours. You know, you develop as, a, as an undergrad student and you get to a point where you, you're pretty much ready to start submitting papers, which is quite exciting. And Coffee Student Association was the other thing that sort of hooked me. Uh, and in the last few years, it's become very active. 
And I think that's a vital thing for honours students because you're sort of segregated from the rest of uni when you're not doing lectures and tutorials. So having a supportive student network there is really, really important. And that was one of my favourite things about doing honours with Coffee. And just finally, I think um, everyone at Coffee in, encouraged me to take and seize any opportunities that came along. And that was fantastic because it meant I got to go to enter different competitions, like poster competitions and workshops, and also travel to a few different conferences, which is a massive part of developing as a student because you get to develop your networking abilities, but also develop those presentation skills that can be so, so vital uh, in the real world when you go out, if, whether that be applying for an industry job or continuing research. So that's all from me and I couldn't recommend Coffee enough. And if anyone wants to ask any questions, feel free to just send me a message. Cheers. Thanks, Harry. That was great. Um, so I'm cognizant of the time. So it's time to wrap the session up now. So thank you everyone um, for dialing in. Um, please feel free to directly email any of the participants if you'd like uh, more information or arrange a one-on-one -on -one meeting um, to discuss a project. In addition, please take a look at the website for each of the institutes. As you've seen, there's lots of um, other projects and information about researchers and research areas. Um, so please uh, go ahead and do that. Otherwise, um, please go on and, and join the, um, the SEMB on a session that's on now as well. Okay, thanks a lot everyone.